Hello everybody, welcome to the second lecture on critical thinking. The previous lecture as you have seen was basically concerned with introducing the idea. I had tried to give you a summary of the main aspects of critical thinking skills and I also tried to tell you how you can develop your critical thinking skills through gathering information, through conceptualizing, through reasoning etc. Now this part of the lecture I shall be talking to you a little about the history of critical thinking skills and also telling you two paradigms, talking to you about two paradigms which have looked at critical thinking skills differently, not very differently but slightly. Now the first concept I am going to deal with is the history of critical thinking skills. I would title this lecture as critical thinking, history and paradigms. Thinking of history, critical thinking I think is as old as human history. Man always had done critical thinking. Think for example, the basic tools that were made by man for hunting. Think for example, the way fire was discovered or think of how agriculture was discovered. How much of critical thinking must have been necessary to start these procedures. Maybe observations were made over a period of time, experiments were made, people tried to find out how to sow a seed, how to grow a crop, how best to harvest it, how best to store it etc. And before that even think how fire must have come to be, how the necessity of cooking was thought of and how it was derived eventually that eating cooked food was better than eating raw and even before that think of how tools would have been developed, how best we can kill animals, how best things can be caught, how best fruits can be got from the trees and how best they can be processed for eating and human consumption. I am sure all of this needed massive amount of thinking skills, massive amount of critical thinking skills. In the present days though critical thinking has become very popular since the mid 20th century and I would like you people who are the budding critical thinkers to link this concept and the mid 20th century with the coming in of globalization. Think of the new market, think of the way, the way of thinking, the way of organizing trade, the way of doing things massively changed at the beginning of the globalization and hence a new kind of skill became very necessary and that was critical thinking skills. It was marketed like many other things, hence the importance of critical thinking skill in the present day. As defined by the National Council for Excellence in Critical Thinking, this council was set up in 1987. Critical thinking was defined like this, it was the intellectually disciplined process of activity and skillfully conceptualizing, applying, analyzing, synthesizing and or evaluating information gathered from or generated by observation, experience, reflection, reasoning or communication as a guide to belief and action. In its exemplary form, it is based on universal intellectual values that transcend subject matter divisions, clarity, accuracy, precision, consistency, relevance, sound evidence, good reasons, depth, breadth and fairness. In short, these were the essential components of what was thought of, what was defined, what was concretized as critical thinking skills by the National Council for Excellence in Critical Thinking in 1987. Can you compare some of these elements with what we had done before, what we had seen previously as part of critical thinking skills? We did think of conceptualizing, remember? We did think of applying it to certain concepts, we did think of analyzing and we also thought of synthesizing. 
What is new here which we have not dealt with previously is the art of clarity, accuracy, precision, consistency, relevance, sound evidence. Sound evidence would mean good evidence, relevant evidence, valid evidence, reliable evidence, good reasons, depth, breadth and fairness. One very important aspect of critical thinking skill is fairness because unless critical thinking is fair, unless critical thinking is ethical, it can have consequences that are devastating. We will be dealing with some of these a little later. Now the final point, now all these, these qualities, these items, these, uh, these elements of critical thinking skills which involves making assumptions, drawing conclusions, understanding implications, accounting for diverse and varying viewpoints and perspectives. All these are elements which can account for diverse and varying viewpoints and perspectives. If this is the basics of some of the critical thinking skills, we will look at a few of the paradigms which were developed for doing critical thinking skills. One of the earliest available paradigms is that of Edward Glasser. He came up with his paradigm in 1941 that I think is one of the earliest paradigms which were thought of on critical thinking skills. But look at the way he defines critical thinking. Glasser talks of it as an, an attitude of being disposed Disposed means an attitude of being inclined to, an attitude of wanting to, an attitude of being disposed to consider in a thoughtful way the problems and the subjects that come within the range of one's experience. A likelihood, kind of a capacity to be able to thoughtfully think of the experiences, thoughtfully analyze the experiences that come your way within your own experience, maybe day to day experience. Secondly, critical thinking skill is defined as knowledge of the methods of logical inquiry and reasoning. The first capacity is being disposed to, being inclined to do thinking, critical thinking skills, being inclined to doing critical thinking, being inclined to have critical thinking skills. And once you are inclined, the second factor that comes in is knowing how to do it. The methods of logical inquiry, the methods of logical reasoning. Again, go back to my previous lecture where I was talking about the importance of training to do critical thinking skills. This is where it comes in. You train once you like to do critical thinking or once you are inclined to do critical thinking, it will also become necessary for you to train to do critical thinking properly. Hence, you also take care of the methods, the way to do logical reasoning, the way to do critical thinking. And finally, the point which comes in is some skills in applying these methods. You learn the methods, you know what critical thinking is, you want to do critical thinking. And finally, what we have to take into account, how to apply the methods we have learned in our day to day ex experience. Now, Glasser looks at it as an ability to recognize problems, find workable means of negotiating these problems. For Glasser, it is also important to gather important information pertaining to these problems, recognize stated and unstated problems, comprehend data effectively and evaluate arguments. In short, he saw it as a way of recognizing the existence of logical relationships between propositions, drawing warranted conclusions and generalizations and finally, putting to test the conclusions and the generalizations. Now, as I was telling you, for Glasser, it was not a skill to be learnt exclusively, 
but an attitude which has to be developed gradually. He thought of it also as a personal quality, as a way of thinking. For him, it was not linked to any specific discipline. It was a general quality of the mind, it was a general quality of thinking, it was a general way of perceiving things. Again, I would like you to remember that Glasser had come up with his way of thinking in 1941. Remember, that was before the Second World War had ended, that was before the whole globalization process started, that was before the open market came into being. You do not find in Glasser, that is why, a very strong inclination to make it into a skill which has to be taught, trained and disseminated. He thinks of it instead as a quality which is there, a good quality which one should have and he looks at it as a way, as a process in which one can develop it and apply it to different things. The next paradigm I would like to discuss is Bloom's taxonomy. Now, Benjamin Bloom in 1950s had come up with a taxonomy which is called the taxonomy of higher order thinking skills. Benjamin Bloom was a psychologist and educator and he talks of the different processes in the mind which are there, which can be developed which can be taught for better thinking, better knowing and better understanding. Bloom thinks of the taxonomy like this. The first part of the taxonomy is Bloom's paradigm. Now, Harold Bloom was a person who was talking about the different kinds of mental uh, processes involved in thinking skills. This paradigm was revised, it was in the mid 90s, but after revising this is what came up. He talked about remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating and creating as the different aspects of the thinking skills which leads to what he called higher order thinking skills. He divided thinking skills into two, higher order thinking skills and lower order thinking skills. The higher order thinking skills are generally referred to as the HOTS. Bloom's taxonomy was created, Bloom talked about it in 1956 and he was basically the chairperson of a committee which talked about these different aspects of thinking skills. But this is one of the very significant taxonomies of thinking skills because since then, it has been used extensively, very widely in the field of education and training. As I have told you before, in the 20th century with the opening of the market, with the redefining redef of the whole concept of trade, with the redefining of the concept of education, with training becoming such an important aspect of education and learning, thinking skills, higher order thinking skills also gained a lot of importance. Now, in this altered state, this was one of the paradigms which was employed very extensively, very popularly to teach people how to do critical thinking. Now, it is a common way used to analyze, evaluate concepts, to look at processes, procedures and principles. It is also used in the field of knowledge. It is used to define, categorize attitudes and also used extensively to categorize and rate skills. One of the very major aspects of Bloom's taxonomy is that the whole concept is hierarchical in nature and this means that remembering is supposed to be lower in order than analyzing, understanding is lower in order than creating. And it is also assumed that one moves up the ladder, that is 
one starts with the lower order of thinking skills and then moves up gradually into the higher order of thinking skills. Now, interestingly, this order of thinking skills has also been thought of according to the different kinds of knowledge processes like we have knowledge types like for example, we have facts, we have concepts, we have processes, we have procedures and finally, we have principles and you have the skill of remembering, you have the skill of understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating and creating. Now, depending on these two axes, it has been used extensively to show how facts as part of remembering would, would basically be listing facts as part of understanding would be paraphrasing, facts as part of applying would mean classifying, ordering, facts as part of analyzing would mean outlining, as part of evaluating would mean ranking and as part of creating facts it would mean categorizing facts into different paradigms. Similarly, concepts it would mean recalling as part of remembering, explaining, showing or illustrating, contrasting, comparing, criticizing or modifying as part of creating. Processes, there is a very little difference between process and procedure. Procedure is basically the, the exact method which has to be followed in carrying something out, whereas process is a larger concept, process would mean the bigger picture, the overall concept. Now, if it is a process, remembering would involve outlining, understanding would involve making an estimate and hence all the processes we have talked about, all the procedures we have talked about like be it designing, be it explaining, be it stating or be it categorizing are very strongly linked with one another and maybe it is very difficult to even say that they are hierarchically ordered. They occur more or less at the same time, they occur in different com combinations, different kinds of processes and procedures d require different kinds of skills and hence I would not really agree with Benjamin Bloom and the followers of Benjamin Bloom that these categories of thinking can be ordered hierarchically and we can think of some of these as lower order of thinking skills and place some others as higher order of thinking skills. Now, one more point I would like to make in this essay is different ways of living also involves different ways of thinking. Now, for example, think of the, uh, the Buddhist way of dialoguing that would involve remembering to a very large extent, but the process of remembering also involves evaluating and analyzing. For example, the way of teaching and learning which was followed by Socrates, again a very intensely dialogic kind of a learning or thinking that involved analyzing in a very strong way, but this analysis was not different from application either, which again was not different from the process of understanding. On the whole therefore, we can find, we see that at different points in history, in different cultures, all these concepts have been used differently, effectively by different people and at different points of time, we find that they have been combined very effectively to promote learning in different ways. Now, I think we will end the second lecture with this. Today, we have seen the, the history and the different paradigms of thinking skills and I have tried to talk to you about two paradigms. One is that of Edward Glasser and the second one is that of Benjamin Bloom very important paradigms, paradigms that have been used very extensively in the field of training. The next lecture of this module, we shall be looking at 
a few more paradigms. Thank you.